I have given a subtitle to the very nice title that was chosen for me, which is to talk about sort of an evolutionary narrative that's been emerging from our studies of the prostate cancer genome. And you've just heard two outstanding talks uh, that, um, that illustrate the power of immunotherapy. And I will give a little bit of background about an, an additional uh, path that's had its share of successes over the past decade or so, which is the use of genetics to identify uh, tumor dependencies, uh, tumor processes on which the tumor cell has an unusual reliance together with the use of rational therapeutics uh, to, to achieve responses, often very impressive responses, where uh, historical cytotoxic chemotherapy had failed. And I won't go through all of the examples, I'm sure you know them very well, of how this paradigm has proved quite useful in extending uh, the benefit, the clinical benefit uh, of many patients with different types of cancer. However, those responses are invariably transient, uh, and so clearly one of the efforts that needs to be done over the next uh, decade or so is to come up with rational therapeutic combinations that can do a couple of things. One is to overcome mechanisms of resistance to some of the uh, therapies that have been successful. And the second is more generally exploit the rapidly expanding knowledge of tumor dependencies that's coming out of our modern uh, tools and technologies of the genome era. And actually, one of the aspects that I'm not going to have time to discuss in detail, but is certainly very exciting, is the notion that there will be a convergence of targeted therapy and immunotherapy empowered by uh, use of genetics and other uh, tools to understand which patients are likely to benefit from which type of cocktail. So this is going to be a very exciting time, uh, and I think support for these types of experiments is absolutely crucial, even in this time of, of budget tightening. Now, in prostate cancer, uh, this critical path has actually been in play for quite some time. If we overlay the, the uh, situation, the current situation in prostate cancer onto the, the generic map that I showed on the last slide, it becomes apparent that we have known about a pivotal tumor dependency, which is the androgen signaling axis, the testosterone axis, for quite some time. And we've had a rational therapeutic that works in prostate cancer, uh, a variety of, of mechanisms now to intercept that androgen signaling cascade. And when we do that, uh, we can, in fact, move the needle. We can extend uh, progression-free and, and overall survival uh, with, for many patients with metastatic prostate cancer. But of course, we are not at the finish line, not even close to the finish line. Uh, we need to understand, as I mentioned earlier, what kinds of therapeutic combinations could be layered onto uh, what has been a very useful, a very effective approach thus far of intercepting androgen signaling to essentially give us durable control uh, of the disease in as many men as possible. And here again, the notion is going to be, certainly we'll need to understand mechanisms of resistance, but uh, critically, we need to understand the full spectrum of tumor dependencies that may be operant in prostate cancer, and one goal is to use genetics and the power of genomics technology to help us with this. And of course, uh, you all are well aware that there have been many pivotal insights from the cancer genome in not just prostate cancer, but across all of cancer biology, ranging from the catalogs of cancer genes that have been enacted by projects such as the Cancer Genome Atlas, sponsored by the NCI and NHGRI, but also uh, just more generally moving from those catalogs to understanding fundamental cellular processes that are engaged in tumor biology, not just the canonical signaling cascades, but epigenetics, metabolism, many other fundamental processes that really, really uh, hadn't fully appreciated the extent to which uh, cancer is harnessing these things. And of course, uh, the, the genetic alterations that emerge uh, tend to provide markers and mechanisms of therapeutic response and resistance. So this is all very important. Now, one aspect, though, of studies of cancer genome that are uh, that is becoming re recently, uh, more recently apparent, uh, and and the, the reason for, for this is, is the, just the massive impact of sequencing technology is the notion that the cancer genome is a molecular fossil record. So just as the human genome is, is a molecular fossil record of the ancestry of, of an individual and a population over, uh, over the course of human history, 
the cancer genome is essentially the same thing for that tumor. You have in the cancer genome the record of its mutational history. If uh, one sequences the genome very deeply, which is now possible using uh, the uh, massively parallel sequencing technologies uh, that, that I showed on this slide. Uh, we can learn not only the mutational history, but also the clonal history. What, what's the major clone? What are the subclones? What is the heterogeneity in the tumor? And this has become something that uh, clearly has implications for the response to therapy and, and, and prognosis. Uh, we understand the genomic diversity. What's the spectrum of alterations on which uh, natural physiological selection could have acted, and what are the treatment-induced bottlenecks? How, how does the evolutionary, how does the genetic diversity change in response to treatment? So we have all this information, but often in cancer genetic and genomic studies, we've considered the fossil record component of the genome as an annoyance. And it is an annoyance when one is trying to figure out what the salient genes, what are the driver genes in cancer? because Every time a cell divides, it, it generates a series of mutations and, and errors, and, and because we have all that, uh, most of what we see is swamped with passenger events. So one of the major activities in cancer genomics has been sorting out what are the driver genes from the passengers, and how do we come up with clever computational algorithms to do that? And that's all extremely important for understanding tumor biology. However, it turns out that this evolutionary history of cancer uh, has its own use. And in fact, the, the, the blended use of passenger alterations and driver alterations may turn out to give us insights not only into cancer biology, but into aspects of prevention and therapeutics. And I want to give a, a touch of how that might be the case uh, for the rest of this talk. So the, the fundamental questions that we would like to ask is if we think about the genetics of cancer from an evolutionary perspective, are there specific evolutionary processes that might have given rise to individual cancers? And if so, and if there are differences there, what might the implications be for tumor biology and treatment? Now, when you think about various models for tumor evolution, uh, we, can, we can use a, a several, different, uh, several different lenses to think about this. And, and the, the default model is really one of gradualism. A, much akin to the Darwinian, the classical Darwinian uh, notion of gradual, uh, you know, change over time that led to full speciation. And so, if we consider the number of alterations, which can be both genetic and epigenetic per tumor cell over time, they increase, as I mentioned, with every cell division. And at some point, if a, if a cell is unlucky, it gets just the wrong combination of mutations, and it becomes a cancer, and then that continues, and a subclone gets another wrong su subset of mutations, and it can metastasize. And so this is a perfectly useful model for tumor evolution in many cancers. Now, this, the slope of this mutational curve can be affected by uh, a number of insults. So for example, if you are a smoker, you may uh, find that the slope has increased because you've, you have provided an, an extrinsic insult to the, uh, to the cellular bed that essentially increases the mutation rate. Uh, conversely, if, you, if it was melanoma, you might have a slope that looks something like this, where uh, because of blistering sunburns as a child, you had a big uh, bump up in mutations, and now you have uh, a, a, a background mutation rate that kind of continues over one's life. But in general, gradualism is a perfectly sensible and, and powerful uh, explanatory model for several different types of cancer. For example, colon cancer, which is the, the classic Vogelgram on the bottom of this slide, uh, obeys gradualism very well, as do other tumors such as cervical cancer, multiple myeloma, et cetera. So this is a perfectly sensible model that has often been the default assumption of how cancer arise. Now, the work of cancer genome sequencing a few years ago, uh, more or less, uh, while not certainly not overturning this model, it really disrupted the notion that this would be the only model for tumor evolution. And uh, an important example of this uh, emerged from the observation of a phenomenon called chromothripsis, uh, which uh, really is, it can be thought of a, a, as a pulverizing effect within a chromosome, maybe a couple of different chromosomes, where there are many dozens, even hundreds of genomic rearrangements that have occurred in that one or two uh, chromosomes or chromosome arms. And the notion here is that this, this pulverizing event occurred 
not by gradualism. This was not sequential uh, derangement. It was a single catastrophic genomic event. So this uh, puts into, into dramatic relief a, a model for tumor evolution that is very different from gradualism. And if you, if you schematize it, as we've done with gradualism, you can see uh, that, uh, that a, a notion would be that at some point during the history there was this uh, black swan event, if you will, that changed the game completely for a cancer cell. And now uh, that alone might have been enough to push it over the edge and then additional mutations uh, occur. So obviously this is not mutually exclusive to gradualism, but it, uh, it, it, it invokes that there was a single catastrophic event that was gating for the cancer. So we now can sort of think of two models for cancer evolution. One is gradualism, one is catastrophe, and obviously the mechanisms of how these might occur are radically different and important to dissect. Now this brings us to prostate cancer. In prostate cancer, there also is a lot of genomic complexity, and I'm so showing a figure from one of our recent papers, which I'm not going to walk through in great detail, but this just shows that from a bird's eye view, there's a lot of genomic complexity in prostate cancer. Now, you could say, well, this looks maybe like uh, chromothripsis. There's, there's a lot of busyness going on, but in fact, it is not. It is very different from chromothripsis. And, and if one takes the various pieces of events that have happened and, and aligns them like has been done in the slide, like a puzzle, and sort of pieces together what happens, you realize that there has been a process that led to this set of rearrangements, which can be uh, shown artistically uh, as more kind of a, a chains and threads where different pieces of chromosomes are clearly attached to one another uh, in, in a, in a complementary way, which is very different from both gradualism and chromothripsis. And the way in which it's different it can be schematized uh, in the following slide. So what we have uh, in, in, this, uh, in this scientific rendition is a scenario where it appears as though Pieces of the chromosomes have been uh, broken and rearranged in a, uh, in a directed way. So there is kind of a, there's been a, a closed event where pieces of different regions in the genome have, have been broken and reattached in just the wrong way so that you have kind of a, a zigzag of, of uh, kind of a, like, it's, it looks, it conceptually looks like a chain uh, that's closed. It's actually not a circular chain, but it is a, it's a chain-like phenomenon that has created a, a sort of circumscribed series of genetic events. Now, the way in which this likely happened, and we, we sort of pieced this out a couple years ago, but we, it's only recently dawned on us what the potential implications of this might be for tumor evolution. The, the mechanisms by which this happened likely exploit two fundamental principles of how the genome is organized, which uh, work by Erez Lieberman and Eric Lander and others showed that it's organized like a fractal globule in the nucleus. But more importantly, that fractal globule exists in two physical compartments. One compartment consists of closed or compacted chromatin, uh, which usually is correlated with genes that are off or silent, and the other compartment is associated with open chromatin. And when one looked at the characteristics of these chains of rearrangements that we saw in prostate cancer, it became clear that you could explain their occurrence by virtue of the notion that disparate regions of the genome from very different chromosomes can come together physically. Uh, and that can happen by a couple of different processes. One of the processes is, uh, is transcriptional co-localization. So it turns out that uh, we used to think of transcription, at least I did when I was in college and graduate school, as the genome being uh, like a rod and all the transcription factors coming to the genes and sitting on the promoters and turning on uh, the, the, the expression of genes. But actually, that's not necessarily how it occurs. As is shown in the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, trans transcription can happen in factories, in in specific regions of the nucleus, and the genome can travel to those factories, and different regions of the genome can travel to those factories, and then the genes get turned on. So it's very different than the, the proteins that turn on genes going to the various different regions of the genome as though it was a, a rod somewhere. And if that happens, errors, the, 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 genome, the, the genome can break. Uh, things can happen, insults. Maybe it's uh, radiation, or maybe it's just some natural process we don't yet understand. It, it, there can be errors and it can break. And if it gets repaired erroneously, you get the phenomenon of these chains. So that's one way in which it can occur. The other way, which we actually 
hadn't been anticipating, but clearly uh, is, seems to be relevant to a subset of these rearrangements, is that uh, the chromatin, so the, the, the compartmentalization of the genome that I was mentioning before, uh, the regions of closed chromatin can also physically co-localize, and errors can occur, and these changes can occur. So you have fundamentally distinct uh, mechanisms by which these phenomena can occur. And by the way, these are also completely distinct mechanisms from how chromothripsis is believed to occur. So if we line these two up, and we talk about chromothripsis as a, as a catastrophic event on the one hand, and these chromosome change that we've seen by doing whole genome sequencing studies in prostate cancer, we can see that these are, in fact, very different, and they, they have, because they are different, they have important implications for tumor evolutions. So on the one hand, as I mentioned, you have these hundreds of rearrangements in chromothripsis, but only a few. We now think it's sort of like maybe five or more linked rearrangements in these, in these chain events. Chromothripsis usually involves one or two chromosomes, but these chain events can involve multiple chromosomes. Uh, the uh, chromothripsis is likely caused by errors in mitosis in the process of cell division, but we think that these, uh, these chains that we first saw in prostate cancer are caused by errors in, trans uh, in transcriptional regulation or chromatin regulation. Uh, and importantly here, we can think, if we think of chromothripsis as a catastrophic event, we can think of chromosome change potentially as a punctuated event, which brings us to a third evolutionary model that anybody who took uh, college biology is aware of, which is punctuated equilibrium, which can be schematized on this slide. So in species evolution, the notion of punctual equilibrium is that rather than there being a continual gradual accumulation of change that natural selection acts on, you have relative stasis that is punctuated by lots of speciation. So this, as many of you know, this model was brought in because it explained the fossil record, the, the species fossil record, better than gradualism. So it's now tempting to speculate that perhaps in prostate cancer, the model for evolution looks like punctuated equilibrium. And some of these punctuations are enacted by these closed chain events. So this is very satisfying in principle, but can we prove it? Well, if this were true, so the question, therefore, is do closed chain rearrangements signify the process of punctuated equilibrium as an evolutionary mechanism for prostate cancer? And as I'll get to at the end of the talk, why should we care? Because this sounds like academics, but you know, what does this have to do with precision medicine? And, and I'll come to that shortly. Well, if this is true, there are several things that one would expect. So if prostate cancer arises through uh, closed chain based punctuated equilibrium, we might expect that those closed chains would be present in a large fraction of prostate cancers. That we shouldn't only see them once or twice here and there. They should be present all over the place. Uh, furthermore, we would expect that some prostate cancer genomes should contain multiple independent chains because that, that's necessary for there to be these punctuated events. Third, we would expect that some chains should exhibit subclonality. So if we can leverage our ability to sample tumor heterogeneity, we ought to be able to say, well, some of these chains are only present in subclones, but not in the predominant clone. And finally, I think this is actually the most important point, getting to why should we care, many of these chains should contain known cancer genes. Because although if, the, if these are just phenomena that aren't relevant to tumor biology, uh, we wouldn't expect to see a lot of known cancer genes. But if these are being selected on uh, by selection in the body, we should. Now, in order to address these questions, we need a lot more genomes. And we've been busy sequencing prostate cancer whole genomes for a while at the Broad, and so we now have a reasonable cohort in which we can start to ask these types of questions. Now, these are called circus plots, where you can see rearrangements uh, drawn as like spokes in a wheel. And if you stare at these circus plots very carefully, the, those who are uh, looking carefully might say, well, well, hang on a second. Some of these circus plots only have a couple of rearrangements. So how could it be possible that uh, these chains are really all that prominent? And it turns out that the reason for this is because these are drawn sort of as a first approximation of rearrangements, but it, it, the, the nature of these chains actually have subtleties that make them uh, more difficult to pick up without a sophisticated algorithm such as one that has been developed by a, an outstanding MD-PhD student in our lab who has applied essentially graph theory 
to, and, and various other factors of how uh, regions of the genome around these change can be different. For example, there can be deletion bridges between uh, segments. And he's used a graph theory algorithm to develop a chain-finding computer program. So he's really gone searching deeply in this genetic fossil record for those chains. And having done that, we can now make the following statements, uh, at least provisionally, we're kind of tightening up some of the numbers. And I'm not going to go through all the data in the interest of time, but I will point out that just going back through the questions that we proposed before, they should be present in a large fraction of prostate cancers, and the answer is yes. They are present in at least two-thirds of the prostate cancers that we could look at, and one can wonder whether or not if we fail to detect some, is it because of lower coverage? If we sequence more deeply, perhaps we would detect more. Now, we particularly notice, note a kind of classic type of change in the ETS positive cancers, but these re relevant rearrangements are present in both uh, ETS positive and ETS negative prostate cancers. Some prostate cancer genomes should contain multiple, and indeed, uh, they do. More than half, we can find uh, at least two or more independent, separable chains that are occurring. So we have the substrate for punctuated equilibrium here. Uh, through a, a, a subclinality analysis that Sylvan developed with uh, Francesca DiMichelis and Mark Rubin, uh, we can show in some cases that there are chains that are subclonal, but there are separate chains that form a predominant clone. So we can see evidence of subclonality. So we can see all of the ingredients that we should see if a chain-based punctuated equilibrium process has been happening in prostate cancer. Now the final point, I'm actually going to just show some data uh, to point out that indeed definitely many of these chains contain known cancer genes. Here's one example. Uh, you can see that the uh, algorithm has put out the zigzags of these chains in a couple of different chromosomes, but right smack in the middle of one of them is a tumor suppressor gene, P10, which uh, most of you will know is highly relevant in prostate cancer. Rearrangement of P10 uh, can certainly occur in the presence of these uh, chains. Actually, Tempris erg, the canonical ETS fusion discovered by Rul Chanayan, very commonly occurs in these chains. And one of the in interesting observations is that sometimes you can see multiple cancer genes, uh, or, uh, including not just rearrangements, but mutations that can arise together in the context of these chains. So with that point, now I don't want to make any uh, quantum leaps. I don't, want to, I don't want to have anything ascribed to me as a, as a quantum leap that I'm already saying is true, but it raises the possibility that in order to, if we see mutations and we're trying to understand in this particular tumor, was this a driver or a passenger, we might want to know, well, was that rearrangement part of a chain? Because if the chains are arising through punctuated equilibrium, so this is part of the evolution and this is evolutionary selection, the, 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 the uh, location within a chain might be evidence that it's a driver event if it was otherwise potentially a known cancer gene, but you weren't really quite sure if this is relevant for that cancer. So, that, if that were true, and I don't know that this is true, but it would have interesting implications about how much genomic information do we need to know if we're thinking about profiling tumors for therapeutic decision making. So we're going to have to do a lot more work there. Now, I just want to point out that although we've done a lot of this work in prostate cancer, if you uh, apply the chain-finding algorithms to genomes that have been sequenced in other cancers, you can indeed find them. So these are five different examples, one each from a different cancer, that show that indeed uh, we can find these chains uh, and they are occurring, therefore, uh, even though they have a particular uh, prevalence in prostate cancer, perhaps just because we've searched hard there for it, we can certainly see them in at least some instances in other cancer types. Now, the ultimate goal is going to be co to combine this type of knowledge with the more kind of conventional uh, base mutations and amplifications uh, that are significant in prostate cancer and other cancers to piece together what the range of dependencies are that we could design therapeutic cocktails against. And so we've been very busy doing that as well. This is a list of significant genes that came out of one of our recent studies, but there have been others as well for example, from a rule Chanayan. And one of the interesting genes that have emerged from this study is a gene called SPOP, which is a member of a complex, a ubiquitin ligase complex, which essentially, uh, as uh, symbolized by the lower left-hand corner of the garbage disposal, essentially it's involved in uh, regulating which proteins go to the garbage dump and which ones don't. So 
uh, SPOP, and as you can see on the right, the mutations very nicely decorate uh, the pocket in the protein that recognizes the substrates of proteins that are going to be ubiquitinated, uh, may define a new biological and genetic subtype of prostate cancer. The reason I say that is because it is the SPOP mutations are mutually exclusive to the ETS rearrangements that one sees. Not only is it mutually exclusive, it also co-occurs with another gene called CHD1. Uh, CHD1 is a gene that was first appreciated from studies in embryonic stem cells where it's known to regulate uh, pluripotency uh, and chromatin compaction. And the presence of CHD1 deletions brings us back to the notion that there are different ways in which these chain and other uh, related rearrangements in prostate cancer can arise, one being transcriptional and one being chromatin-based regulation. And indeed, uh, we have data that suggests that CHD1 loss in prostate cancer is, a is associated with uh, rearrangements involving closed chromatin in prostate cancer. So to begin to summarize, we can now conceive of three models, which are not mutually exclusive, but may have important mechanistic implications. Three models for tumor evolution. Certainly, the model of gradualism is alive and well uh, for many, if not most, cancers. But we can also perceive uh, at the bottom that there are these catastrophic events, chromothripsis being one, but actually in hindsight, we can think of telomere instability as potentially another. But a third, which has maybe been less appreciated, then which prostate cancer may exemplify could be a punctuated equilibrium, and it may be that these, uh, these chain-like events are actually telling us that there is a process of punctuated equilibrium that is driving at least some prostate cancers. And if that's true, it'll be important to understand the biological processes that regulate uh, these types of things. So, there are a lot of important questions in prostate cancer that remain unanswered, such as are there specific genetic features that, dis that distinguish indolent from lethal disease? Can we discover the uh, tractable, therapeutically tractable dependencies in lethal prostate cancer? Uh, you know, what about the ancestral variation? What about the fact that it's so much worse seemingly in African Americans than uh, Caucasians? You know, how do we understand that? And of course, mechanisms of resistance to antiandrogen therapy, which I mentioned at the beginning. The important thing, though, is that all of these questions, in principle, could be addressed, at least in part, by genomic studies. So at the end, why might tumor evolutionary history matter? Well, the, these mechanisms clearly are different. They're vastly different. If we can understand how they occur, and if maybe are there ways to slow them down a little bit, could that have implications for cancer prevention? Certainly in prostate cancer, but maybe in other cancers. Might the nature of some of these change and other uh, rearrangements help us distinguish indolent from aggressive cancer? We don't know. This is total speculation, but certainly worth asking. Are the genes that are present in these chains more likely to be driver events? And if that were true, what implications might that have for precision medicine? We, we think of precision medicine as we're going to go after the known base mutations, the known point mutations. We don't really think all that much except for those rare um, uh, chromosome rearrangements that are druggable, like ALK rearrangement and lung cancer. We don't really think about sort of categorically knowing about rearrangements, but what would this mean if that turned out to be true? We have to do a lot more work in this area, and prostate cancer could be an important place to do it. And the final point that I'll make is none of these observations about the rearrangements and the chains in uh, cancer genomes would have been possible without whole genome sequencing. Whole genome sequencing is the only way that you can find these events. They are invisible to most of the other approaches that we are uh, pursuing. So therefore, uh, additional efforts, which are certainly being uh, helped by, um, by the Cancer Genome Atlas and others, will be uh, pivotal for augmenting our understanding. So I will close there. Obviously, these projects require not just one lab, but cooperation of many labs. But they are making us very excited that knowledge of the genetics are going to continue to propel not only targeted therapy, but, but in the future, perhaps, combinations of targeted therapy and immunotherapy. And with that, I'll stop and take questions if there's time. Uh, I do want to ask you about, about the new Google map for genomics. Um, what are your feelings about, about ENCODE? How are you going to use it? By now, I'm sure it's been downloaded to the Broad Institute. How's yeah. that going to change your, your work? Well, I think one of the interesting things about these types of maps that become available, particularly as we start to see this landscape, this complex rearrangement landscape, 
we need to understand to what extent all of these types of events are happening, not just in the coding regions of the gene, but in the non-coding regions, the regulatory regions, the, the, so, uh, what we always talked about is junk DNA. You know, the, obviously, a lot of these events are landing in parts of the genome that really, really haven't understood all that well. Th these types of convergences should, in principle, uh, as long as we can put enough smart people who know how to program in computer language uh, on this project to understand what some of these rearrangements may be doing things that we can only understand by the blend of, the, of these types of resources. So just one other point, unless there's a question. Yeah, Ken, Ken. Hi, good morning. Um, great talk, Levi. You know, one of the things that w we've been wondering about, and I wonder if you could apply to the punctated model is when you do have a, a driver and then you see an accumulation of, of um, mutations, do you see an acceleration over time in how fast those mutations happen? Um, you know, do you, is there actually, or is it a, you know, sort of a stochastic event, or do you see you know, acceleration over time so that it makes sense that the more mutations you have, the more it drives, or actually do you see a slowdown in that the rate, because once you have a driver, you don't need as many mutations. Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't asked that specific question yet. However, the framework is now there to address it. So for example, if you have deep sequence coverage and you can say there are at least two clones, one majority, one minority clone, one which evolved from the other, we can potentially go into each clone and say, what was the mutation rate in clone B versus clone A, and is it greater or less? And we could potentially infer whether or not there's an acceleration or deceleration of background mutation rate, perhaps either triggered by therapy or something else. I think it's a very interesting question, and that could be addressed by these types of approaches. Yeah, a couple of years ago, it was found that androgen receptor can drive these genomic rearrangements. What evidence do we have from all these sequencing studies that some of those, are, those rearrangements are driven by AR? And would we expect androgen deprivation therapies to inhibit that aspect of AR function? Okay, so that's a great question. I'll, I'll kind of answer it concisely by saying that right now, from these studies, it's a little bit difficult to, to say which came first, the chicken or the egg. So did AR induce because it's the master transcriptional regulator in the prostate, it, did it induce these chains? Uh, or is it that, uh, you know, these, because uh, AR is a way in which an oncogenic effect can occur, you just have selection for chains that happen to co-localize with AR loci. I, that, I think, is a little bit harder to tease out, but certainly uh, there's very interesting evidence to, to suggest that AR could uh, be a trigger for some of these. and, and uh, I don't have a good answer for how that will affect uh, our therapeutic understanding, but as we collect genomic information post-treatment, in the post-androgen ablation setting, we can potentially get a sense of whether or not there are changes that track to the effects of su suppressing AR. 